Um, thank you all for being with us this afternoon. For those who are joining us on the live stream, I'm Erica Warren with Try Excellence, uh, my esteemed colleague and our um, founder, Dr. Stephen Hold, is also joining us this afternoon. We are excited to be with you. Wow, meeting 18 for the Historic Albina Advisory Board. We appreciate your patience as folks are maneuvering the Zoom world and going from meeting to meeting to meeting. And uh, many of us have not um, perfected the art of scheduling time in between. So uh, thank you for your grace um, as we continue to navigate this reality. Um, next slide, please. For those of y'all who are joining us uh, via the live stream, if you have some technical difficulties, just notice uh, the number there, 503-479-8674. We have a wonderful team that's uh, available and ready to help you. Next slide. Today in our meeting together, we are going to again, highlight our principles of agreement. Those are our um, commitments to each other as to how we are going to engage uh, as we come together on this project. We'll have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, and then Ms. Megan Channel will give us some really exciting updates uh, in regards to um, the project, uh, the COAC, and uh, then we will also um, be sharing with you uh, a website update and um, we will dive into some design uh, with our wonderful um, urban design team. Uh, and then we will wrap up today's engagement together. Uh, next slide, please. You all are pros at this. Uh, I'll, I'll embellish a bit. Your voice matters. Your um, Participation matters. I'm so uh, grateful for your continued engagement. We need you in this space. Um, you are helping to hold this project accountable to something uh, that can be so wonderful and beneficial for our community. So please continue to engage us. I'm gonna pull out of some of us um, as we continue to move forward. I know you always will be authentic and genuine and that you all are pros at listen for understanding. Um, this is a passionate subject. We love our community. And so we understand all of our positions may not be the same, but thank you for dealing with issues, not with people uh, that we can stay um, respectfully engaged with one another. Some of this is gonna be uncomfortable for us. Uh, it has been, uh, but we are working through this together uh, and I'm so appreciative. Uh, we won't solve everything uh, that has happened in the inner Northeast uh, and, um, but we can one step at a time um, come to some collaborative effort for re-engagement, reinvestment. So we ask you to expect and accept non-closure as we continue to work together on the I-5 Rose Quarter project. Next slide, please. At this time, we are going to open it up for public comment. Um, we always wanna make sure that we're giving an opportunity for um, community members who may uh, have input or questions, things they wanna share to express themselves. Uh, and so I believe, uh, Ms. Natalie, are you helping me with public comment today? Yes, I am, Ms. Erica. Thank you. I can get started. Um, just a reminder that uh, members of the public viewing the meeting on the live stream uh, may make a verbal public comment by phone at this time. And if you wish to do so, please dial the phone number shown in the uh, right uh, corner of your screen here and enter the meeting ID and passcode shown below it when prompted. And after doing so, you will be placed in a virtual waiting room until your turn to speak. And when that time comes, we'll invite you to unmute yourself and speak your comment verbally. Speakers will have up to two minutes for their comments and will be muted at time. And if you'd like to provide more extensive comments to members of the HAB, please see the options listed on the meeting agenda. In addition to any verbal comments that we hear today, one written public comment directed to the HAB members was shared with them in advance of today's meeting. And a reminder to please mute your speakers if you are watching on the live stream while you're making your public comments to minimize the feedback. And I'm just looking to see if we have any Anyone coming into the waiting room wishing to make a public comment? And I'm not seeing anyone there right now. 
would you have a little delay so we could wait a moment or two? We can give just a moment. If you're still seeing none, Ms. Natalie, I'm okay with us moving forward. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Please make sure if you're joining us late, uh, there are plenty uh, of opportunities for you to engage around the I-5 Rose Quarter project so that we hope you will avail yourself to all of those things. Um, with that being said, I would like to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Ms. Megan Channel. Thanks, Erica, and good afternoon, HAB members. Um, awesome to see you here again today. Um, my update's pretty quick today. I wanted to hit on three things, um, just a status on the intergovernmental agreement with the city of Portland, um, an update on the um, opportunities by way of request for proposals um, on our early work packages and kind of bringing and expanding uh, teams into our pre-construction phase uh, to help us gear up for early work package construction. And then third is just an update on the supplemental environmental review process for the proposed um, hybrid three highway cover design. So um, I'll dive a little bit deeper here on the next slides. Go to the next slide. Oh, there's my three things. We can go to the next slide, uh, in fact. All right, um, so first I'll just kind of kick off um, status with IGA um, kind of while you're sort of taking in project timeline as well. Um, but we're still working on the intergovernmental agreement with the city of Portland um, and honing in on a council date coming up here in May. So um, early next month and uh, the intergovernmental agreement is with the respective ODOT and city legal teams for review. Um, so we are making good progress there and um, hope to have that in front of council, um, as I said, next month moving forward there. And again, just as a reminder on that, um, the intergovernmental agreement um, does provide um, funding for the city services to participate in the project um, by way of supporting development of these early work packages that you see as well as the main construction package, which is really the core and the center of the project um, with the highway covers. Um, so with uh, development towards these early work packages, um, you know, as you, as you remember, and we've shared with you previously, we are gonna be delivering the project um, kind of in these um, separate packages. So starting with early work packages A and B, um, in late 23, so late next year, early 24. Um, early work package A is on the left side of your screen, the north side of the project, near 405 interchange. Early work package B, right side of your screen, south side of the project, near the 84 interchange. Um, we've got early work package C that starts to kind of connect into the center. And then the center is that main construction package that encompasses the highway covers. Um, so you can kind of see the, the timeline and sequence of that work. Wanted to just highlight um, uh, my second update is really um, kind of an uh, opportunity uh, for pre-construction uh, phase component of those early work packages. So with early work packages A and B, um, Hamilton Sunt Joint Venture, who is our CMGC, our Construction Management General Contractor, uh, they have started a series of solicitations for what we call mini CMGC or mini general um, uh, construction manager, general um, contractor uh, contracts to join again the project uh, early during the pre-construction phase. And this mini CMGC opportunities, um, they're really, I'd say the first actions that we're taking to implement the project's diversity and subcontracting plan, really that, that action towards maximizing opportunities for small um, and DBE businesses in our work so the solicitation packages uh, are really broken down by specific scopes of work for each of those early work packages. So think walls, um, civil work, sign structures are kind of the three main ones. Uh, so the Hamilton Sent Joint Venture Team and then the mini CMGCs that are selected through this solicitation process 
will have this mentor protege type relationship to help those mini CMGCs or mini primes, if you will, build the skills and the knowledge to grow their business while also supporting the development of our, um, of our work towards construction on early work packages A and B. I'd say another um, item to highlight in this schedule is a change and an update in our environmental review timeline and the completion. Um, there's some additional traffic analysis work um, that we have to do right now just to make sure that we're getting the most accurate information to compare um, hybrid three kind of to the um, kind of with the, with the prior um, project and include that information in the supplemental environmental assessment. So that pushes us to an early 2023 completion of the environmental review for that um, for the proposed hybrid three instead of a late kind of end of the year 2022 timeframe for that. So just wanted to note, a, note that shift by way of schedule as well. Um, on leading into the supplemental environmental review update, if you go to the next slide, please. This really breaks down kind of where we are in that process um, in preparing the supplemental environmental assessment. So um, you can see here that the team we're on the left side, we're actively preparing, developing and reviewing the updated technical reports uh, and the consultant will be um, preparing the supplemental environmental assessment based on those technical reports. There'll also be um, several more rounds of internal review and coordination over the next several months uh, to prepare that environmental assessment um, as it's published for partner agency and public review in the late summer. And then following that review period, we'll update uh, any, any necessary items in that environmental assessment based on the comments that we receive, and then we'll send it to the Federal Highway Administration for their final review, and ultimately a NEPA um, decision is determined there with that uh, decision document anticipated, as I said, in early 2023. So those are the key kind of three things that I wanted to hit today by way of update. Um, Erica, I understand that Janelle is not able to be with us this evening. So I might just quickly roll into a COAC update and then I'll pause if there's any questions. Okay, great. Um, so uh, COAC, our Community Oversight Advisory Committee, again, uh, just I wanna celebrate the moment that we had earlier this year in finalizing the diversity and subcontracting plan uh, for the project at that 30% design level. Um, this Thursday uh, will be our next meeting of the COAC and we'll just be continuing our discussion on those early work packages, how we're sort of taking action on the diversity and subcontracting plan and really making sure that we're having an intentional conversation and exploring ways for continued outreach um, of those workforce opportunities. And I think specifically around those opportunities for these upcoming um, solicitations for the mini CMGCs. So that's what we've got going on on the COAC side. So with that, happy to pause and take any questions. Tab members, do you all have any questions for Megan in regards to um, any of the updates uh, in regards to the project? the IGA or the COAC. Seeing none, um, I'd love to uh, be able to turn it over to Ms. Tia Williams, who will be helping us through the next area of our agenda. Actually, I will be taking over for Tia Williams this well, evening. Thank you, here. Rose. Uh, Tia could not be with us this evening, but uh, I am Rose Gerber. I'm the uh, um, public outreach and media manager for the Rose Quarter project. And I'm going to share a bit with you about our new website and video. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, the new website was relaunched on March 31st and it offers visitors more inviting and engaging user experience. Uh, keeping people up to date with the latest I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project news and ways to engage with the project. And the website incorporates the project's new brand, uh, which reflects a community-centered project identity. And in developing the new brand, uh, ODOT engaged the services of two Black-owned small businesses, Stanton Global Communications 
and PDX Black Excellence. And their work combined to result in a brand that was heavily influenced by interviews with community members and conversation with this uh, board as well. And you can see the results in front of you. Lovely, beautiful um, brand that's now infused into this new website. And so um, we are going to quickly open up this new website so you can see kind of the live version of it. Uh, I believe Megan has also put it in the chat if you would like to navigate on your own and there. I'll wait for, for us to get that up there. All right. So as you can see, we have the rose quarter area highlighted in the photo, but we also have a new tagline bringing change to the quarter, which, um, and right below that as well, um, just kind of a very sub tagline, if you will, uh, describing the, uh, we could scroll down just a little bit there, Natalie, um, and just kind of highlighting that this is a uh, project that is safely connecting communities while investing in a better tomorrow. So uh, encompassing all the aspects of this very large and complex project, but the two main focuses being safety improvements and, and community connections. Um, so uh, back, back to the top, if we could, Natalie, I just wanna highlight that um, if we have any comments today and you're on our website, feel, feel free to reach out to the project through the share comments site. There are a lot of opportunities to reach out to the project through the website. And there's some navigation options up top there that include uh, ways to look at our news, um, uh, our library or project library under resources um, with, thank you, Natalie, with uh, the link to every uh, document that's relevant to the project historically as well as current. Um, and we'll get to into the community in a minute. I want to scroll down our main page here and just share with you some of the features that we have included here, including a quick link to what's happening now. Um, and uh, right above that is actually a survey that's live right now that we're going to be sharing soon. But I just want to point that out that when you're ready to participate in our uh, giving input into design elements of this project on the survey, uh, sorry, this survey is uh, an opportunity to do that. And you can just click on that and head right to a quick three to five minute survey. We'd love your input. If you scroll down even further, um, we have an interactive map about the project features that helps you understand the components of the hybrid three uh, cover concept, which is the highway cover that's going to be spanning um, the length of the uh, project area. That's a uh, kind of in fun and in interactive way, and it'll highlight each portion as you click on it, as Natalie's doing now. And then if you go down below that, um, we have a little bit of history on the project as well, ways to learn about how it came to fruition and where we're at in the process. Yeah. So, um, uh, Natalie, if we could, I would like to share just quickly our um, project success stories page, and then we'll move over to the Albina, Voices of Albina page, which um, we're very excited to share a video with you on. So, um, Raymore Construction uh, is a large contractor on the project. It's a DB that is, uh, is part of the Hampton joint venture that Megan mentioned earlier, the CMGC. Um, they, these are um, success stories that they have pulled together of, of, from the project, uh, folks that um, have found their way through the construction industry and their journey through that. And um, they're beautiful stories, with a lot of great um, life experience here. So uh, please join uh, us in exploring these when you get a chance. And then uh, finally, um, we're gonna move over to the Voices of Albina page, which is just under the community tab. Uh, in the community, oh no, I lied. I'm sorry, it's on the homepage. Natalie's way ahead of me. Um, and we have um, uh, to to give you a little background here. This new five minute video that's highlighted here um, is called Voices of Albina, and it it paints an honest picture of the reality of life for Black Portland's residents and their hopes for Albina's future. And uh, it's a product of PDX Black Excellence. Um, and under the leadership of veteran film producer, Martin Jones of Martin Jones Films. Um, and it, it speaks to the Black Portland experience and features notable local business leaders, um, some of which are members of the co and HAB. And we'd like to take a, a few minutes just to share this video with you now and, and show um, you what was pulled together by that firm. Thank 
you may not know, or you probably do, Oregon's racist history, founded as a white utopia. Fast forward, 1948, we've got the war, we've got Kaiser, Henry Kaiser, who's building these ships, and they create Vanport. So the flood happens in 1948, wipes out Vanport, and now people are forced into uh, the city and ultimately became Albina, or a space called Albina. And Albina was its actual own city. There was actually a mayor of Albina. So Portland didn't want the black folk and the poor folk, and Vancouver didn't want the black folk and the poor folks, hence Van Port, this compromise that gets wiped out through a flood. Albina was the area where there was it was really kicking, you know, I mean, it was really, really, really nice. Anything that you wanted in the area, television repair, shoe repair, record store, dry cleaners, whatever, was there. And you didn't have to go out of your community to get anything, you know. I remember, I vividly remember as a kid, going with my mom and my great-grandmother to visit different elders in the community at their home and checking in on people and dropping off food and picking up a chicken dinner from this church's fundraiser because there were so many black churches that were significant um, in our black community. The um, Albina area before the Moda Center, prior, because I can go way past before that, like, because the 60s, I was born in 1960. We could run in the street. We could, we played kickball in the street. We ran up and down the streets. There was a ton of black people. So it was, it was like a little community of people that everybody knew you, everybody looked out for you. Now, because of the motor center, the parking's crazy. There's people that don't look like you anymore. The neighborhood has changed drastically. Well, you know, when I, when I think back to when I arrived in Portland, um, I didn't arrive without knowledge of Portland. Uh, you know, I was at the college playing ball, like a lot of young people, uh, thinking that I was going to go to the next level, and um, ended up staying, you know, started a family. Uh, but what I recall is seeing the incremental removal of uh, the neighborhood. Uh, I, I recall seeing the allowance of decay. I know that ODOT played a significant role in dismantling and destroying the Albina community. With working for ODOT, I know given the history um, in constructing I-5, um, doing it without the community's voice, um, which led to the construction of I-5 through historic Albina, was uh, the wrong way to go, and we are definitely in a trust deficit. If we're gonna talk about how great Portland is, how great Oregon is, what about the community and the people, the, gen the people who've been here for generations? What needs to happen to correct some of the things of the past, then also include those communities in the conversations and the planning for moving forward. The I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project is a transportation project, but it's also so much more than that. It's a community building project as well. So from the transportation side, we are making it safer um, and uh, less congested on the I-5 corridor where three interstates are coming together. So we're focused on I-5 between Interstate 84 to the south and Interstate 405 to the north in the heart of Albina, in the heart of Rose Quarter. We get asked a lot, what is a highway cover? It is a wide bridge, think of it as a land bridge or a cover, a cap over I-5. So it'll provide the space for roadways to connect over I-5, but also new community space on top. ODOT's role is to build that canvas, that space, um, and then we will be looking to the community to help us define what is that place uh, that will be on top of the highway cover. I look at this project as an opportunity for economic advancement um, for black Portlanders, from a ownership standpoint for businesses, from an ownership standpoint for homes. The economic benefit for, from this project will give black people more choices. We don't want low income housing or modern income housing. We want the ability to have choices of where we want to live and how we want to live. That's the big outcome that we should be trying to focus this new project on. We can look at what happened to us in terms of the displacement, and we can look at the people who kicked down the doors and the giants that came before us to get us to this position where we are now, right? Regardless of how people feel about it, ODOT has been very intentional in bringing the community together. There's a healing that I think needs to take place, and maybe this project is big enough 
to, to begin to kind of prod us to say, where are we? What do we need to do for future generations? But there are so many opportunities um, for new collaboration, new business, artists to be involved, uh, uh, folks to become journeymen in trades. So really this is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, for us to capitalize on what infrastructure projects, what, what needs to be done you know, logistically for, for transportation and safety. And uh, my hope is that we leverage all of it. Wow, thank you, Rose, for sharing the new website. I uh, wonder uh, if any HAB members have feedback um, about um, the new work, the new branding, um, or the video that you all just saw. I seeing some comments uh, and some emojis. Um, would love to hear your feedback. Dell and Ebony, I see someone just unmuted. I saw Josh, Josh had his hand up. That's the only reason I, I didn't. Oh, no, you're fine, Estelle. Okay, okay. I think he would just had an emoji. Oh, I really liked the video. That was really well put together. And I liked the stories that were highlighted. That was, that was excellent. I really, I like how that represents us. That was very good. Appreciate your comment. Any other thoughts from HAB members? Well, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to um, Project Leadership for acknowledgement and for continually uh, working with and, and um, uh, diving into the growth um, uh, for uh, your colleagues, for this um, organization, and helping us to collaboratively build a better future for everyone. So um, I appreciate the work um, from PDX Black Excellence for uh, the project deciding we needed to go to the community to talk about the community. I think that's an important I think to highlight. So thank you for your openness and your willingness. Rose, thank you for being here for Tia tonight and sharing with us. Please send uh, folks to uh, the new website. Um, it is really well done um, with your input in the branding. Um, that's um, how we got where we are. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, Miss Natalie, if you could share the slides, we're going to move further uh, into our meeting today. I know there are a couple of other HAB members who are joining us just a bit late. Um, but if we don't have any other comment or question, I think we can move uh, into our design update uh, with uh, my colleagues, uh, James McGrath uh, and Mary Ann and Bill, who are here uh, to engage with us. So hopefully this group is small enough where we can uh, have some dialogue and move the conversation forward. So thanks, James. Thank you. Um, next slide, please, Natalie. Um, we wanted to just start with um, a couple of things. Um, the first is, and I think you saw a link to this and, and it should have already been shared with you, um, but there was a link on the website uh, where we are taking a bunch of the topics that we've been working on together over the course of the last few months, and we are sending them out for a broader set of engagement um, to, to, to make sure that it's not just your voices that are making the decisions for the project, but you are informed about what others are saying as well. It's something you've been asking for. Um, and so this is one example of us um, uh, hearing you and trying to do that. And we actually think it's gonna set up a template for how we do our work together going forward. So right now, 
uh, at that link, you will find, and it's for you to distribute and share with, with, um, with your communities and, and folks that you think might be uh, interested in doing this work. It is making choices or getting their preferences around the medallions that we talked about, around the patterns, the concrete patterns that we might impress into the crash barrier and ideas for the concrete collar. So those are the, the three ideas that we have sent out this boomerang. And we intend to come back to you in June with a summary of that feedback, sort of uh, some demographic information and some of the preference information so that it informs you as we seek your recommendations and advice on making final design decisions that will then go into the construction documents. So that's one chunk. And as I said, we really think that this is going to work as a template for how we make decisions and work together in the future. So tonight we'll wind up talking about a couple of new topics uh, and revisit some old topics. And our goal is in working with you to identify a range of ideas that you think are promising of interest and that we can send out for a broader round of engagement. And we'll do that three or more, four times more over the course of the year en route to making some decisions and choices about what gets included in the project. So that's the online survey. You should have a link uh, and you can distribute that and take that survey yourself. It's all information and all depictions and things that you have seen. Um, we will use this uh, methodology and diversify it as well. Maybe they'll eventually there'll be a point where we can do some in-person work um, there might be different ways that we reach out to a broader set of community members, um, but we're going to keep doing that. And then I think a really promising and exciting part of broadening engagement is the upcoming Youth Design Forum. And so next slide. Um, this is you have been asking and uh, and thankfully we have the support of uh, Andrew and Sprint Avasa have really taken this up. Uh, and are championing this event. And, and I'll open it um, to, to both of you, if you're interested and willing, if, if Sprinavasa, I just saw something in the chat about your Wi-Fi signal. Um, Andrew or Sprinavasa, anything you wanna say about this? Um, Cause it's pretty exciting. Uh, sure, I can be real quick. Good afternoon or evening, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. Um, I do look forward to the youth in engagement um, workshop as a way to just to um, model what we all have been saying before about just getting the younger generation more involved. Um, so this is a good opportunity and also a good way to uh, Hybrate um, some grassroots organs, nonprofits as well. So um, I look forward to it. So thank you, Andrew. Um, we're excited. There's a lot of work happening behind the scenes to pull it together. I think it's something like 75 or more. Um, youth of color that, uh, that are registered or, or are seeking to engage here. So it promises to be really good. We're bringing a number of topics. There's a career forum at the outset of the day, but then there's going to be specific discussions about the Rose Quarter project and some of the design ideas um, that, again, we will find a way to report those findings back to you, that involvement back to you, and use it to inform our process and our decision making going forward. Any other comments about that, Erica or others? coming soon. I would just say um, uh, registration hasn't opened yet. So the slots yeah. aren't filled. If you uh, know of other organizations um, that have youth who identify as black and brown and would love to be a part of this conversation, we're looking to you all to help us to um, get the word out. Uh, so to your networks, um, organizations, um, your places of worship, uh, your wherever there are young people, um, we would be looking to you to help us uh, to get the word out. Uh, Camp Elso is graciously hosting. Um, and so we're appreciative of Word is Bond and of the I-5 Rose Quarter Project for coming alongside to help um, make this uh, come to life. And uh, we see this as an important engagement so that there is intergenerational input uh, on a project that will, will affect our youth for uh, years to come. So thank you for uh, partnering with us on this uh, and moving this information into your networks. 
Okay, with that, we're going to pivot to uh, our other format for sharing and working together with you, which is the Miro board. So if I could ask Tiffany uh, to share your screen. And we're going to dive into, we're going to hope we have time to dive into three topics, some of which we've talked about before, um, but uh, maybe with not as much depth. So here they are right in front of you. And we'll, remember, we can zoom in and we can zoom out, and we will endeavor to do so in a way that doesn't induce vertigo. Um, we're going to talk about wall 15, which is, that, that's the name of the wall that's used or the, the number of the wall that's used in the document. We'll guide you to that and talk about why. We're also gonna talk and revisit a, a conversation that we had early on about bridge treatments. That includes um, where we might do these around the project area. There's like six or seven locations. We wanna talk about that. What style uh, of treatment do we use? And what words uh, might we actually uh, say on those bridge treatments? And if we have time, we'll talk about some overarching ideas around elements of recognition and themes for the kinds of stories uh, that get told, the kinds of betterments and maybe commissions that occur uh, throughout the project area. It's a little bit more abstract, but, but a really exciting part of, uh, of our work. So we'll start with wall 15. And, and um, for those of you who have, uh, you've been with us all uh, through, through all of this, please feel free to interject. Whether it's in the chat, we'd prefer to hear your voice. If you have a question, if you have a comment, Please let us know. We can slow down. We can speed up. We can zoom in. We can zoom out. So maybe Tiffany, if you could guide us to the the roll plot, so we can see the whole project area, and I'll show you where Wall 15 is. So there's the whole project area. The 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 cyan thing over on the left is the project covers. I promise we will eventually get a chance to talk about that. There's the uh, the roof of the Moda Center and the Veterans Memorial Coliseum and the uh, Convention Center, of course. So it's just sort of the big wayfinding. Wall 15 is, um, you can see the, the cursor, wall 15 is in a really conspicuous location. It's a new wall. There's a wall there today, but it will be rebuilt. And it is the primary wall that you will see as you cross the steel bridge, as you enter the east side and Albina on the light rail or by foot and even by car. It's in a very conspicuous location. And we think it is an opportunity uh, for community expression. And that's what we're gonna talk about first. We're gonna talk about a range of ideas. So I, I'm gonna try and keep with the chat. Okay, um, I think we're, we're okay to move. So wall 15 down at this Southern end of the project area, there's nothing really in front of wall 15 um, because there are all of the streets and the light rail crossings and all of the things that, that happens in front of the Moda Center. So it's a very, you, you can see wall 15 from a number of places. Uh, and therefore, we think it provides an opportunity to do some interesting things. So with that, I will ask Tiffany to move to the options around wall 15. And Marianne is going to guide us through some, some design options that we've uh, started to explore. Now, remember, our conversation with you is about your preferences, your ideas, creativity, new ideas, um, commentary on existing ideas. We don't have to drive to a choice tonight. We want to get a range of things that you think are promising that we can send out and have others um, uh, express their opinion about. So Marianne. You're on mute. And you're, you're going, you're going for it, but Marianne, you are on mute. Okay, there you go. Uh, wall 15, if we could look at the existing site photo, that'd be great to start with. As James mentioned, it's there is a wall there now. Um, the new wall will be about 400 feet long and as tall as 17 feet in the middle. So it's going to be big and very prominent. All of the trees that you see there are going to be cut down as part of this project, unfortunately. So um, we have put together, as James mentioned, we have some ideas. Uh, we'd love your feedback on them um, just because something's on A and you like what's on D. I mean, things can be combined or thrown out as, as well. So let's look at um, some of the options or ideas. Maybe we'll look at A first. Um, idea A really is very much green. We're looking at, re in actually in every single option we're looking at, we're looking at revegetating that hillside between the top of the wall and the edge of the freeway. Uh, getting as close to the freeway as we can. We have to stay, have some setback for safety reasons. 
and maintenance reasons, um, as well as looking at where we can put planting in front of the wall. Um, there, we'll look at the plan later, actually. Um, there isn't really the ability to plant in front of the wall as we move to the north and the south, but we're looking at the opportunity to have vines that would grow over perhaps an armature of some sort at the left side. Um, but maximizing our um, opportunities for, for green on this option with the opportunity of, of maybe marking the neighborhood with some letters up above that would be freestanding letters, um, kind of like the Hollywood sign, it would be the Albina sign, so. And I would say, Tiffany, don't be afraid to zoom in because there is a level of detail here. I would characterize this option almost as the make it go away, make it disappear, right? Let's not have a lot of big and conspicuous concrete walls, but let's try to have things grow over it and, and make that wall disappear. That's sort of on one end of the spectrum of ideas. Okay, let's go to B. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, so this idea was Albina lives. Um, just take it or leave it, uh, just a thought, kind of combining both um, marking the neighborhood and uh, creating a sense of um, entrance into this, this neighborhood that used to be here um, with, with still with vegetation as well. These could be cut out steel letters. They could be backlit. Um, they could be this painting on the wall. Um, there's an opportunity to use LED lights, which provides us with a full range of color spectrum. So there could be color washes behind these walls. Um, and then combining some of the other elements of, in terms of like armature against the wall to plant vines and other things. We show um, up lights in the front, in the foreground. So this would be dramatic at night as you're coming across the bridge. Um, the only thing, I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll just add some commentary here and there along the way. Um, the governance of signage in central Portland is pretty robust. You can't just add a billboard. You can't just hang signs wherever you want. There are, there are rules around this. And there are also ways to negotiate those rules. So we're sharing this as an idea of something big and bold and bright, and it will take some process. We may discover some things along the way. So, so I, want, I just wanna be clear that we haven't, because we don't have our city partners back at the table, we know the idea of statements and signage, even murals to a certain degree, um, there, there, there's some governance and some laws around that and we'll, we'll have to na navigate that if this option is really chosen and is really promising. Um, right, and the other thing I think I'd add on to that, what James just said is that we don't actually exactly know how the wall's gonna be built. The, the, um, the type of construction methodology they're gonna use. So all of these things are just really conceptual, really kind of just to get your feelings for what, what kind of works or doesn't work. So we don't actually know how we would exactly attach things at this point, nonetheless. Let's look at C. Yep, the contractor, as we move to C, the contractor submitted some ideas for uh, either a quicker or, or um, more efficient way to build that wall. And it would have some aesthetic changes, but we think that this range of ideas could be applied to however the wall gets built. James, let me uh, add to- Go ahead. Yeah, James, let me just add one thing. Um, I know the city hasn't really come to the table as of yet, but I've, I've had um, preliminary discussions with contacts at, at RAC, and they're very collaborative about making, it, making this work. They're, they're very interested in, in participating and in making sure the idea of the signage, the displays, that there's ways to um, um, get around some of the challenges with the existing sign code if we work with RAC, and they seem to be willing to kind of do that. So I just wanted to let folks know that. Excellent. Great. Uh, this option C, uh, using some of the similar imagery that we saw in the video, um, what was Albina um, before the freeway came in? And uh, this might be an opportunity to have some large printed panels on the wall that show what it used to be. Um, for uh, so many people that don't know the historic context, this would provide an opportunity and we've got a very large canvas to do that. Um, we, we went to, uh, Bill and I went to visit a print shop and they can print panels on perforated aluminum. And I've got some examples to show at the end. Um, so we could do this on a printed panel that would be um, 
uh, able to be washed off if it was graffitied. And um, so there's the ability to print photos or whatever graphic content we wanted to write on those panels. So Let's some more commentary on this. And, and yes, uh, the first is it is important to acknowledge maintenance and graffiti. This is also a wall that the, the, there's a sidewalk directly adjacent to it. So it is very close to people. It's easily accessible. Maybe Tiffany, you could zoom into the right to just give folks a sense of the scale of how big is a person relative to this wall. So it, uh, it, it's one thing to say it's this long and this tall, but that's, that's a person, right? So these, we're talking about something that is really at scale, very conspicuous, but also down low. And so that, that might want to uh, feature in your thinking about what are the treatments, what is the level of resilience uh, of those treatments. Um, we have had conversations with, with maintenance teams uh, for the agency, and we certainly know from other public clients the importance of maintenance um, and keeping things as nice forever as they are there the, the day they're installed is, is a consideration that we'll, we'll need to uh, factor in as well. Uh, we also have some sections that we could show now or when we're done. Well, why don't we go through the rest of the options and then we'll look at the sections just so you can understand the scale of it. So um, option D, these are, um, these are some cut steel panels, possibly in weathering steel, which has a rusty patina that would um, use similar patterns that we've talked about for the crash barriers. So mud cloth um, derived patterns potentially. Um, these two could be backlit and though once again an LED a color range we could you could change the colors um, at, at, per the season if we wanted to. Um, once again we've we've tried to put in as much vegetation as we can um, to kind of uh, bring that whole uh, scale of it down to human scale. Um, James, did you have anything to say? Uh, well, just to zoom in, maybe give folks a, a sense of the level of detail that we can get to in, in this. It's steel, very durable, rusty, also really um, um, weathers well, and there's a level of precision that can come from this. So, so don't let the materiality be off-putting. There's a level of detail that we can get here. So the letters themselves are, would be steel cut out of those panels as well as the, um, the patterns. So it's all kind of like a negative space. And then on the end, we show, we just show a grid of steel that we could grow plant materials on. So, and then finally, um, we have one last one, uh, which would be, what if we had um, no, no written albine on it? We had though a rotating art collection. So we could have different artists provide, um, some art panels that could last for a year, maybe up to five years, and they would be rotated through. And those could be painted directly on the walls. Those could be this perforated steel that I've mentioned. Uh, there's other materials that we can print on and actually adhere to the walls that also can be washed off. Um, they have an anti-graffiti coating. Um, so I think there's a lot of options and we might wanna zoom on, in on those. We took these from a, um, a young um, black artist in Atlanta who has an amazing website of different murals that he's done around um, the Southeast. So, and there's some great panels I think that were done in um, Alberta recently by some local artists as well that we could use for models. So um, this too could tie in with some of the themes that Bill's gonna talk about in a little bit. So here we've kind of looked at music um, and entertainment as a, as a theme. So this could be abstractions or it could be, it could also be people. Um, so let's look at the sections just so people can understand. Let's pause for a moment. So, oh, so five options, but Sprinta does have her hand up. Oh, yes. Yes, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, my connection is good, I'll ask a question. So um, this wall in comparison to some of the other prominent walls, um, I, I'm wondering about sharing history on this wall versus another one. Would you all say that this is a, a great wall because of its placement, size, visibility to have some of those historic images or would there be some other options? So if we lean towards liking that design but maybe the placement would be uh, better on other walls. Like it is, are there other comparable size walls that would work well for sharing those historic pictures? That's my first question. 
there are, uh, w- this is wall 15. There's probably 20 some odd walls on the project. Um, there are, this is, I would, I would submit with my knowledge of the project, this is the largest and most conspicuous wall that faces the community with the exception of the wall that is near Harriet Tubman Middle School, right? Which has it, that, that primarily faces the highway, but there is the component, the inside face of that, because it's a sound wall, it faces the school. So there are other slivers of wall around this area. And we can, we can go up to the roll plot and look at those. But um, a, as a short answer, this is the one that is most conspicuous. On the opposite side of this, there's another wall of some scale that faces the convention center, which is, and it's the back of the convention center, right? It's not as uh, well-traveled by. It's wall 14 is relatively large scale, but you don't see it in the same way. It's not front and center in the way that wall 15 is. So I would submit that this is an opportunity because of its scale and because of its location that is different than the other walls. There will be some walls that flank the entry to the tunnels, but again, those are primarily viewed by folks on the roadway, on the main highway, not even folks in the community. Mm-hmm. And, and James, I would just add that wall, like wall 15 with it um, being so adjacent to the Rose Quarter Transit Center too, like not only are you capturing just visibility and location, but you've got kind of a high pedestrian sort of mm-hmm. network that's going through. Um, it's visible for people that are driving through on the local system. Um, folks that may be, you know, traveling to or from Moda for events, um, that would probably be the, one of the more visible walls as well. The, bu- the bus goes right by it. It's a major bike transit um, uh, route as well. So there is, it's, if you come off the steel bridge, as mentioned, you're going to see this wall. So it is a most very prominent wall. Okay. So. Well, I'll, I'll finish my um, questions and comments and then I'll, I'll yield back. I uh, really like the idea of C, the integration of the history. I think some combination of um, words and narrative storytelling, since it is at street level and vi- um, visible, would be great. Um, I do worry about graffiti, but I think that's going to be a concern no matter what we have. My other question is about the vegetation. I'm wondering if you all have a methodology, so to speak, where if there are 15, let's say, um, older, more established trees removed, that there needs to be that many put back or twice as many. Um, that, or um, kind of along with that, will there be requirements for native plants? Um, I would love to see native plants added if there is going to be vegetation and also edible plants um, as well, knowing that there are members of our community who might be looking for um, easy access to something to to eat. So those are my my comments. Uh, Thank you. And I'll yield back. Okay. Um, Well, I'll take that as a landscape architect on the team. Um, Interestingly, um, and we have not started working with the city yet, but within the ODOT right of way, ODOT is not required to meet like the city of Portland's Title 11 tree code. So the way we're approaching it is we are trying to put in as many trees as fit, you know, based on their mature size and needing to have a setback from the wall for maintenance and also from the roadway. So we have some constraints in that way, but we are trying to maximize um, conifers and broadleaf evergreens based on e- you know, um, EPA um, reports that we've been provided with. Um, so in terms of natives, we are trying to use a lot of natives, uh, especially in the shrubs, Um, because we are trying to not only put in a lot of conifer trees, but we're trying to put in a lot of broadleaf evergreen shrubs. And both the trees and the shrubs, what they do is they help collect the particulate pollution matter, um, which would lead me to not wanting to put in edible plants, because actually all those toxins that are in the, you know, the air that unfortunately we are breathing when we're walking by the freeway are collected by those plants. So I would think that I would actually not want to put in plants that people would, that would attract people to want to eat them. That said, I mean, there will be native shrubs like salal, possibly Oregon grape. Those do produce a fruit that is edible. But once again, I wouldn't want to encourage people to, um, to come through here and snack because I don't think it would be healthy. Does that answer your question, Sprinavasa? You just texted that, yes, it's that, that okay. is helpful. 
And I would just say, I'm, you know, we, um, we do have a plant list already available for early work package B, um, which we can make available to the HAB to look at. And I would, you know, if you have some ideas or you concerns, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you about plants. Excellent. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Tiffany, maybe we could zoom out and, and look at all five. There are other, uh, as Marianne said off on the right, there are some sections to give you a sense of how people feel in relation to this. Um, but as we, we just... as we take a step back and we look at these five, any comments, any, any ones that are promising or that you want crossed out and not considered as we go forward? Remember, for those uh, like Ms. Sharon who, who've joined us, the idea is to discuss a range, but then we'll be asking a broader group in the community about their preferences as well. So um, we don't need you to drive to a particular decision tonight. Right. One of the things I was gonna mention is the image at the bottom right with the, with the young people in it. This is, this is actually printed on metal panels. And if you zoom in, you can see the graphic clarity that we can, we can get on printing on perforated aluminum panels. Once again, we can put on an anti-graffiti coat onto those um, and these can be done locally and then attached to the wall at a later, at a later point. So. Excellent. James, I see hands from Estelle and Bryson. Well, we'll do it in that order then. Hello. Um, I really, really like the historic albina. Is that C right there? Mm -hmm. um, I liked that a lot. I Instead of um, the albina lives, uh, oh, bye, Spravasa. Um, I thought maybe, um, I don't know if this would be appropriate, like we're still here instead of albino lives, but I um, kind of like that a little bit better. Um, I had uh, questions also about the trees being cut down and kind of concerns about, um, about that and where along the project, if there's gonna be any more like, you know, large swaths of, of trees or, you know, however many it is, of trees cut down, if maybe we could kind of get some, some notification. I don't know, that was just kind of like shocking to me. Um, and then I also had questions about, you know, replanting the area and vines and like, um, you know, the maximizing for green. And then I also, um, I thought I liked the art idea too. Um, I think that was like D down there and I I thought it might be neat to rotate it and like maybe and that could be a way we could in the future like engage the community in the project like hold a contest or something um to see who could you know have their mural put up there uh so I like that and the freestanding letters I so my top ones out of those I guess would be the historic albina and the the freestanding letters there too, because I don't think we have anything like that in town currently. So that's my, like more than two cents. <laughs> that's great. In terms of the trees, um, we will have a count at some point of how many trees we're able to replant and how many trees we will be taking out. That's gonna be a little while though before we know that for sure. But just, we are trying to replant as many trees as we can that we have room for. Um, that, is, that is a goal. And we have met with maintenance and discussed it with them and you know, kind of have parameters that work for them. Um, and then know that we're trying to maximize, as I mentioned, the evergreen um, plant material. Thank you, Estelle, for that. Um, I, while you were uh, talking, it looks like Andrew also weighed in on the chat and says the combo of A uh, and C, which is again, sort of maybe this resonance around historic albina, but also people liking the lettering. Um, and then Ms. Sharon uh, also said, uh, let's, she didn't say this, but, but not really liking albina lives. So I think we should cross off option B at this point. It's just not, it's not compelling. Great. Okay, this is really good feedback. Other comments Bryson? before we? Oh, Bryson. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I like, and, and you know, just as you were mentioning it, the the letters, uh, having the letters go above like albina, but also maintaining the 
the, the pictures as well. And then kind of one question I had with the uh, murals on the metal is, would that make them portable? So if we had a rotating, if we had a rotating mural thing, could the, you know, could we do like, for instance, Estelle mentioned a contest. Could you have like a contest for people to come in and then later off it could get auctioned off for uh, some community support cause or something like that. Um, and somebody else could then take it and display it on, on their building or in their location. The um, short answer is yes. Oh. Yes. The, say, the, go ahead, Marion. Oh, I was just going to say the longer answer is that outside um, those panels probably have a, a, a length of time that they're going to look good of about five years. I mean, give or take. I mean, this wall in particular is going to get a lot of sun on it. It's pretty exposed. So no guarantee, you know, beyond five years, how, how they'd look. That would be the only limitation. I think the idea of a rotating mural program, whether directly painted on or attached and relocated and renewed, takes administration and that takes partnership. That is not uh, ODOT's core business. Um, so that would take a partnership and maybe RAC is that partner. Maybe there's another partner, but that's uh, if that idea is really compelling because of the perpetual creativity that can be brought to the wall, that's really exciting. And then we'll have a lot of work to do together uh, to form the partnership to, to make that real. I think the technical part is the easiest part. Design the wall so that you can attach things, take them off, attach them again. Like that's really easy to achieve. It is uh, stewarding the, the, the content and the, you know, running the contest and, and doing it forevermore. Uh, until such time as, as the excitement around newness wanes, perhaps, and we choose something that's a little bit more permanent. So, but, but it seems like a, an idea worth exploring and, and that is attractive. It, it, James, um, I think as we get into the discussion about the themes, and you know, I've been looking at that with Marianne, and um, I think as we talk about the themes that will be coming up either shortly or later, a bit later on, we've been trying to develop themes that relate to our our, part, our adjacent partners next to it. For example, let's do something, let's set up a theme that relates to the Rose Quarter. Let's set up a theme that relates to commerce and other things. So we've got some things to share with them that talk about developing ongoing stakeholders and partners that would support doing the, um, the idea of continuing the, the, the murals and this kind of artwork down the road. So that's one of the things that we're kind of looking at is how do we how do we wrap these, uh, these betterments with partners that are around us that have land very close by that could be providing some sort of financial support in terms of making things happen and keeping a rotating uh, view of artwork and historical exhibits? Yep. Well, I feel, unless there are other comments on wall 15, I feel like we can't, we've gotten some really good feedback here. There's things that we're not going to advance. There's others that we might pull together as a hybrid and then um, we will, we have the opportunity to come back and say, is this what we heard? Let's, let's take this subset of ideas and bring them out uh, for broader engagement. Any final other comments uh, on wall 15? All right, this is great. So now we're gonna, we're gonna return to a topic. Once upon a time, um, a few meetings ago, we were talking about what can we do on the edge of the bridge? The first thing we tackled was the crash barrier. We came up with a couple of uh, patterns for the crash barrier, the medallions, all those sorts of things. Those are out for broader engagement right now on the website, and that's exciting. But the truth is there's more that we can do on those overcrossings to announce this place, uh, to celebrate um, the, the, either the history or the energy of the place or its legacy. So we want to talk about that. So um, Tiffany, if you could zoom in to the Russell Street overcrossing uh, three dimension, we, we, this is a little bit of an updated image, but this was the image from a few months ago that was, folks, y'all got excited about the idea, not just the words of historic Albina, but like that there was, there was an opportunity to do something on these bridges. So we wanna revisit this topic. Um, and, and this is the gist of it right here, right? We know we're probably gonna have a medallion on it. We'll probably have a column pattern on the new bridge uh, columns. There might be something that we get to do uh, north of Russell Street in this instance. But ultimately, I want to focus your attention on those letters. 
not just what they say, but the style of them and where we do it. So now, Tiffany, if you could zoom out and we can look at the overarching, here's the project area from end to end 84 to, to 405. And on the project, there are four, five, six, I wanna get this right. There are six locations where there's a new bridge that has an edge that faces the community. There are other slivers of bridges and structures and things that are happening on the project, but these are the places that are again, conspicuous. And we'll talk about this over and over again. And, and we'll, we have a whole third section of our meeting today that we'll talk about this, but it's our judgment and our perspective that the betterments and the things that we're doing should be placed in, a, in spots on the project where the most people will benefit and interact from them. If we're gonna tell a story about history or we're gonna announce a place is special, we want to announce it in, in places where people are moving to, through, under, over, and around. And so this subset of six bridges corresponds with where people are going. So we know that Russell was an important corridor in Albina, and we have a new bridge over Russell. So we want to talk about that. We want to, we want to make sure that you agree or that we are starting to arrive at an agreement that it is worthy of some investment. But then there's the bridges that flank the existing highway that are down by the convention center. We were just talking about wall 15. There's a whole area of construction around there. And our question to you is, is it important to, to, um, to use those bridges on both sides to also communicate something uh, to, to the community and the people who are traversing to and through the project area? So that's the, the big question here is how many? How many of these do we want? And I just saw a, a, a question come in from Andrew. Will this apply to pedestrian bridges too? Um, as part of hybrid three, the adoption of hybrid three, the pedestrian bridge is gone. So there are only roadway bridges as part of the project now. There is no, it, I think we were used to call it the Clackamas overcrossing. That was removed as part of hybrid three and the green loop was placed up on Broadway and Widler. So we really are just talking about the roadway bridges at this point. So is it fair to say that Russell, shown here on the left, is a place that we would want to put a bridge treatment? It seems almost unanimous in our last HAB meeting that Russell Street deserves that kind of attention. Um, I'm not sure we need to revisit that one. I'm seeing some head nods. Um, can I just ask that question of this group? Do people feel like Russell is the kind of place where we want to put something on that bridge? We, we can pick the words later, but that, that it deserves some kind of a treatment? I say yes. I'd say yes. Okay. So we'll include Russell in this and then we can move on to what style and what words. Now I wanna zoom in. Maybe you can just use this drawing to zoom in and let's talk about Multnomah. So Multnomah and Holiday are right next to each other. It's actually one big long bridge that will go over that whole area. It's a new sliver of a bridge. It's actually one bridge today. It's kind of obscured uh, by some of the landscape and whatnot. Multnomah, is very close to the, um, the Moda Center today. And you can see, maybe you can uh, keep zooming in, um, Tiffany, to the view of Multnomah, what it looks like today, the street view, right? So there's Multnomah, there'll be a new bridge in front of this. And on the other side of Multnomah, um, it is an interesting part of the, the city. It's sort of this squiggly road that connects to the Multnomah um, that traverses the, the sort of upper Lloyd district, a very sort of large grand street but it kind of squiggles down here. It is now the back, or I guess it's the front door of the convention center hotel. It's, it's got a bunch of different kinds of uses. The question to you is, should we be treating these bridges on both sides of Multnomah? Should we be communicating to people on the east side of Multnomah as they come, let's say they're coming to a game or they're coming to an event in the Moda Center? Should that bridge also have some sort of statement on it or some sort of betterment and treatment? Or the other side? Do people have strong feelings about this? Maybe not. We, we think similar to the conspicuousness of wall 15 that we just talked about, having something, we don't know what yet, having something that faces the west side can make a lot of sense because so many people can see it. 
Now it's a little bit cluttered with landscape and whatnot. But when you go to the other side of the street or the other side of this bridge, it's not as clear to us that that is a place that is uh, rises to the level of needing a betterment or that kind of investment. Any thoughts on this? I know it's kind of abstract what I'm asking. I, I do have a question. So just for clarification, the west side is where the max is kind of at where all the buses, the bus stops. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah, and the east side is... It's just a quiet... I mean, yeah, you, you can coming still... Down the hill. Yeah, but you can still see some of the east side part walking down where the max uh, tracks are at. So just keep that in mind. That's why I was saying possibly both, because depending on someone's um, eyesight, they can still probably see uh, the east side. They can probably still attract a lot of eyes on that side as well so that's just my feedback yeah and maybe tiffany you can zoom into that holiday east side that is if you walked out the door of the convention center or the convention center hotel you are looking at this right and there will be a new bridge in front of this as well and so this seems like a place where if we wanted to make a statement or have a better sort of expression of infrastructure this would there'd be a lot of eyes on this street So the holiday in Monoma East Side, that bridge is still connects, right? So essentially, it can be something on that whole. It could wall, pretty yep. much right. Just we will have a wall. pattern on the crash barrier, which is a big part of the the way the bridge will will face the community. But below that crash barrier, there's the actual depth of structure. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to put something. And we were thinking, based on your initial feedback, we were thinking that that something was going to be words. It was going to be place names. Maybe, Tiffany, let's zoom out and I'll hand it to you to talk about some observations you made about the West Side and what it feels like down there, what, the, what it looks like today versus what it might look like in the future. And, you, and, and maybe that will help us um, um, through the discussion. I think the other, James, I think the other thing that I would add or just make folks aware of is that, you know, right now you're seeing these images during the day. We're, we're recognizing there's opportunity with a little bit of lighting for all of a sudden for these to be great displays at the end of a Blazer game or for a concert or something. You're going to have so many people arriving by um, light rail, the buses, and walking back and forth that these, these two spots have a lot of visibility to really deliver a message. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about the west side of Multnomah and Holiday. So this is a little collage of the existing condition right now. Um, so again, this there will be a new bridge built outside of this existing bridge. So it is a really long extent. Um, it's about 400 feet. Um, so right now it is obstructed by trees, um, which unfortunately will be um, removed for construction. So there is a chance that you could see this entire um, area if you're standing in just the right place. But these views are taken from the Moda Center area um, where we are not impacting. Um, so the trees in the Moda Center area will block parts of that new bridge, depending on where you're standing. The uh, bus shelters that we are not um, touching on this project could block some of those views in other places, um, like here and here. So it was our judgment from our most recent site visit is that um, it would be difficult to write a message that spans all the way across Multnomah and Holiday on the west side because you would have to be standing in a very particular place to read it all. Um, but um, what we have been testing here is um, different types of style of the lettering um, over Multnomah and over the holiday where the MAC stations are, incorporating color or not, um, 
more blocky and bold or versus more of a kind of scripted, more stylized kind of fonts. Um, and doing that in combination with some patterns, some of which we've talked about before, the heritage patterns from weaving. Um, and again, this is all going to be in the context of the smaller scale um, betterments that we've talked about, the medallions, the column collars, um, and some type of signage along the, the columns, which we've talked about before, the pillars of Albina. So there are a lot of different scales and levels of boldness and intensity um, that we can be using in this area. Um, there's going to be a lot of eyes in this area. And I think the thing I would like you to think about as we're going through these exhibits is what feels right for telling the story of Albina here? What feels appropriate? What feels like it makes sense in this context, which is so dramatically different from how Albina was, um, which has a lot of very busy signage. Um, so we can pause there if there are any comments to start, or we could go to uh, the other side of holiday, the west side, when you're coming right out of the convention center. Sharon. Thank you. Um, in the time that I've been here, this has been exciting um, to um, actually be thinking about what would it look like? What is the message that we would be announcing? What would people hear and what would resonate? Um, who are the people who would question the what, the why, the how? Uh, I've been struggling in a good way around what are we saying about the albino that was removed? What are we saying in the 21st century in 2022 about what was here, what was vibrant, what was uh, exciting, what was creative, what was cultural? about this space that now holds a, you know, a Memorial Coliseum, a box, and it holds the, you know, the, the, the Moda Center. Who were the people? What is it about bringing people together? So I struggle between what happened and what removed it and how do we announce, because it's not back in the same way, but it's tribute, it is recognition, it is a critical source of the Portland um, being Portland, whether that is good news or not, it really was a vibrant existing place. And so how to be consistent for me in signage, in messaging, in graphics, whether people can see it easily, as you mentioned, where we would have that very easy view, Russell, or where people might see snippets because of planting or other obstructions, there is some consistency about why we say we must do this in a new vibrant built community. And so I'm um, struggling around what is it that I want somebody to say, hey, why is this being done? Hey, what does that mean? Hey tell me more about what this was mm -hmm. or why there are some that I believe knowing Portland and Oregon, why are you doing this? Why is this being highlighted? I want it to be about history and recognition and reclamation and rejuvenation around who was there and who we're speaking for and to. And so I'm worrying there's a little bit of a uh, a struggle in my head around how not to make this gimmicky because it doesn't it doesn't make up for the harm but we're talking about not just healing but we're talking about it reestablishing the importance of this area and I, I I want to hear us think about how we can do that with the signage with the imagery how are people going to be transiting through this area by car, by bike, on foot? And what is it as they walk the pathways of Lower Albina that connects us to this larger city of Portland? And I, when I figure it out, or as we talk it out, it's helping me kind of consider 
why it is so important. You tell stories and pictures in, in land, in walking. There are so many ways that you tell stories, even those that have been buried or lost. And so I'm excited, but I'm also hesitant and really want us to be particular about how we do this in all of the various ways that we could do it. I'm a legacy child. I just went to my home that my parents moved after it was taken. They bought it from Buck, I think on the courthouse stairs. And people came out who were Californians. I was being filmed and they started talking to me and asking me about this house. And it was an amazing conversation. They were a white couple from California and they were stunned and amazed that there's this story. I said, though, every place around here, there are all kinds of stories. And they said, where would you send us? Where do you think we should go? You know, other than back to California, which wasn't on the table. <laughs> so I'm just saying that's the kind of thing that I would want this to do, including those who are reluctant or recalcitrant about why. So thank you for allowing me to go there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We, we have been struggling with this as we've started working through this. If we're going to make this type of bold signage, it feels like it has to be really genuine and, and the project can live up to it. So we absolutely do not wanna do this yeah. uh, in a way that doesn't feel appropriate and reflective of the reality, the situation and the hopes for the future. So yes, and we know it's a lot to absorb right in this meeting. So as everyone is absorbing and working through it, we would really welcome feedback later in any form that feels right to you. And you might you might move in just to give Let's, people more visual information into the, the other images that you've developed, because I think it can help. We're not, we're, they're not even propositions. We're just trying to guide you into like, what could it look and feel like? Yeah, all of these I think are, are really helpful as people are, are thinking on it. The other thing to acknowledge is this isn't the only place we can do it. And the words or the signage or the things that we hang on the bridge might not be, it might not be the right mechanism. Maybe, maybe we keep it really simple on the bridge and that's okay too, because what we're trying to do is too complicated to just hang on the outside of a bridge. So I think all of those are, are potential. Yeah, I, I think the other thing, um, uh, great, great comments, Sharon. I think one of the things that we've been thinking about, which I want to talk about is themes, is that as we've been talking about storytelling, we're talking about a system that brands this whole project and talks about Albina. And I've been looking at really um, themes about themes of recognition, elements of recognition, because there are, we've had some real champions in the past that, ha that have been the pillars, both, both individuals and organizations that have done a lot to support Albina. And I've kind of been looking at that um, about how we identify various locations to, to look at several different themes. Um, you know, I can begin to talk about it now or Tiffany, if you have a little bit more or we can switch over to the elements of recognition. Let's, let's not switch yet. I think we need okay. more time to just let this unfold. And, and that okay. can be just next. Tiffany, I think just maybe moving through yeah. the the images that you've developed, but Estelle, while, while you're moving through, Estelle's got her hand raised too. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, Go for it. I was kind of curious about, you know, while we're talking about signage, you know, the people will see, you know, driving or coming in. Um, if we, if we should be thinking about having it kind of match what's going to be under it, you know, like we were talking at one point about like a basketball court or a bodega or things like that. And so if that was still like an option and then maybe thinking of the signage that we would want to kind of um, coordinate with whatever would be un under it as well, like uh, lighting or, or things like that. Great comment. And yes, they absolutely could relate to the uses and the themes. That's something that Bill is going to talk about later, that, that it does have to come together in a certain way. Not every one of the undersides of the bridges will have a use, quote unquote, a use underneath it. But that's a that's a good connection uh, for us to, to try to make. 
Right. But Tiffany, th this was an image that you developed just identifying the amount of visual clutter that's out there, right? So in terms of being careful, it's, it's like, well, does this message, if we choose to put words on these bridges, it would have to compete in this really cacophonous visual landscape. And that was uh, Tiffany's observation of being out there is like, this is going to be really challenging because there's so much that is taking up the space now. Yeah. Yeah. The signage, um, it's very prominent daytime, nighttime, and the physical environment has been aggressively and dramatically made it into the Rose Porter Moda Center Convention Center. Um, so yeah, these series of drawings were just trying to work through how it would feel if we put the signage above and try and kind of match the scale of the signage that is there in the area. Um, kind of similar material discussion of what Marianne went through. It could be cut out of metal. It could be a bright um, panel where you cut the letters out. All of these could be backlit. So it would have some prominence at night to compete against these other major elements. Um, it could have um, a font that is more evocative of previous time, more stylized, um, more unique compared to the kind of more modern look of the fonts that we see out there. Or we could not do signage on that bridge part above. We could use patterns, we could use imagery. We could use some of those historical images that people responded to very well on wall 15 or it could live on wall 15. So these were kind of using some of those heritage patterns that you've all seen before in earlier conversations with us. And then last, um, here we go. We could bring the conversation to eye level, really when it is somebody walking by with time to pause and read. And we could make the, the naming, the education, the highlighting of art, it could happen at that small scale, assuming that somebody has time to pause and isn't just biking or driving by. Um, and it's not being consumed at that quick speed as the big Moda Center sign or the convention center sign. And again, this would be coordinated with the themes that Bill will get into um, with the highlighting key members of the Albina community. James, I wanna draw your attention to the chat um, earlier when Ms. Sharon talked about a destination tour, almost like the Portland community walking tours. Um, and it seems to be a popular idea um, I also see a comment from um, Kevin in regards to um, local artisans and opportunities uh, related to this work. Hmm. James, you're muted. Good, James. <laughs> um, re re uh, after all these years. Um, regarding the walking tour, um, I think that's a great idea. I think that is something that we keep in mind all the way along. And then we unite all of the investments and all of the things that we've done into something really um, significant. And I think also in partnership, right, with, with other developments and things that are happening uh, in the project area along some of these corridors. I love that idea. And it seems to me like it is being mindful of it as we do our work the result will be a rich experience around which we can, we can uh, draw a path. So I like that and we will, we will keep that in our mind as we explore doing art versus history versus collaborations, whatever it winds up being. I really like that. And, and integrating it, frankly, with, with you know, the other historic places that are a little further afield than just the, this project area. It's really a, a more robust, experience albina to answer kevin kevin's question that is that is something we want to do and what we what what i say as part of the project team is that we are trying to set the table and get ready for a broader set of collaborations we do not have and we have not stood up yet an artist's program in part because we're trying to work with you on this bridge or uh, on those medallions or wall 15 to identify the potential canvases that we're offering people. 
right? If there was a real interest on wall 15 for growing things over and making it disappear, well, maybe it's not an art opportunity. So as we, as we work with you to identify the places that are most promising, we know we need to stand up an arts program that will reach out to local artists and engage them on the project. I don't think we're there yet. We're trying to get that full list of, you know, the maybe it is murals or panels on the Harriet Tubman Middle School. Maybe it is those historic panels on wall 15. It could be this pillar of Albina idea that we have talked about before, but it won't just be those three. So we're trying to get the bigger list together and then stand up an actual arts program on the project. And now I see Bryson, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, taking it back to Tiffany's discussion about the signage at eye level, I think if we, you know, thinking about things that we can do at eye level, that's probably going to be the best location for it, you know, where you've got people walking to the Moda Center and you've got people standing there waiting for the Max and things like that. Some of the other some of the other walls and stuff, you know, you might get some foot traffic by, but it's going to be a lot fewer and, and further between. Whereas this is really going to get crowds of people who are likely to spend some time standing standing there. Obviously, we wouldn't want it, you know, at a spot where you've got to stand in the street to read it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think I think that'd be a great location for eye level eye level uh, components. Great, and I see Dr. Richard has his hand up as well. Thank you so much. My question centers around how much space will there be to actually tell the story in narrative form and not just focus on legacy? Legacy is important. My dear colleague, Sharon Gary Smith, I agree all day long, legacy is important but there's a reason why we call it legacy because there has to be a remembrance of something in order for it to be legacy. So how much space will there be to share narrative about how we got to this point in terms of the Albina neighborhood? Second question, how far east could we possibly go to also tell the story uh, about the impacts and ramifications of the different projects through the years that has displaced the black community. Thank you so much. I yield back. I will, I'll, I'll try to answer Dr. Richard. The first question about how much space for the narrative, I think is undetermined and directly influence. You can directly influence that, right? As we have um, and this is actually going to head towards the, the conversation that we'll conclude with around uh, areas and places of recognition. We're trying to identify the key areas on the project where we can double down and put a sequence of investments. And some of those investments could be around really robustly telling the story. We haven't hired artists, right? We haven't hired historians. What we're trying to do is find the locations where we can put things of some scale that can tell that story. So if a if that becomes an objective, that that it's not just a celebration of arts and culture, or um, it, it's it's acknowledging the legacy and the history, but it's also telling more robustly and conspicuously and readily available for the public the story of what transpired and the harm that was done and by whom. That, that sounds like it's becoming a thing, an object, a, 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 something that needs to be commissioned and located and put somewhere. It strikes me that that might be something that is up on the covers as part of a, 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 a real investment in telling the story um, where there's going to be a future created as well. So that idea, that kernel of an idea about really telling the story robustly in narrative form could become an object and a thing that gets commissioned as part of the project. So is that, is that an answer? Does that answer help? Thank you so much, my dear colleague. It helps. My mindset is really focusing on restorative justice. That was the basis and foundation of my question. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can have true restorative justice 
if we only tell parts of the story. That's why I was asking about space. So maybe that's a conversation later on down the road. Uh, and I will be eagerly awaiting that conversation. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I think we do want to continue that. To answer the question about how far east, which was the second half, the project does have a boundary where it can make investments and where it has a footprint. Um, and the place where it stretches furthest to the east, I believe, is up near Broadway and Widler. Um, and so, but that's really only just a few blocks. Um, so, so it really, our investments are concentrated along this corridor with a few tentacles out uh, a little further to the east, maybe a little bit past Victoria um, on Broadway and Widler. So not really that expansive. Okay, so um, we're grappling with a, a, a complicated topic and we've had a good initial discussion. Um, there is a whole nother topic around themes and areas of recognition, but I don't wanna move off this. I'm getting the sense that there's more design work, there's more, there's more thinking that we need to do to try to frame this up. Unless you all are feeling that we, we have six bridges, we should invest in those six bridges, doing something on those six bridges. Do you, are you interested in having a discussion around what words or is that premature? I wanna honor what Sharon said earlier about like, you're, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about how do I see it all together? Um, we thought we might get into what, what words would we put on Russell on that bridge? What words would we put on Oregon Street on that bridge? But that might be too detailed and I don't wanna, I don't wanna push it. Sharon? You know, um, the more I look at these photos of Holiday East Side and recognizing that there are lots of blind spots that would actually block, beyond suggesting we blow it up, which I mean, that is the drabest, most uninviting, most horrific area that really doesn't have people in it that it's supposed to be an entertainment area. It hardly ever is. And when the Blazers lose, then nobody's ever around. But I would really want to figure out, even with the organization, this thing about messaging that could be consistent coming down through you know, Vancouver, Flint, uh, going up Williams, somehow a tie in with all of this gray property I'm not suggesting we repaint the Moda Center, but that's an idea. I mean, that they repaint it. But something that this community is larger than just what we're speaking to, and it moved in and out, touched these places. And so I just want to, when we think of the words and messaging, there's a whole lot of space here where things could be that are now, um, that there are barriers to necessarily seeing it. I will try to work this out in my head, but the more I look at this, the more I see it, it, it invites some kind of retrofitting that would connect. Because otherwise we could have a vibrant new community with covers that kind of reclaims. And then we've got this. And right. it's almost like a hard stop, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I want to, that was the area also and this is not a particularly uh, good example of what could have been. And so I just, um, when you're talking about signage, I keep including this and thinking about how do we get around this huge kind of space with no real vibrancy unless people are there at a game. I want more connection with what we say, what we see what we do, and that's just me. But somehow I feel like a lost opportunity to talk to Blazer management about the benefits to you getting on board differently than what we have. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of partnerships, and Bill was uh, alluding to it earlier around reaching out to those who are proximate, right? That is clearly a partnership 
that could be coaxed into yes. enriching the conversation, but also taking complementary action. And those um, who profited. Yep. And Sharon, what I'll add is, you know, we're going to be engaging um, Moda Center and Rip City Management in kind of the traffic related design. So I think it's a good reminder that it's not just about, you know, the the physical space of the roadways, but the surrounding spaces too. So I'll make sure to carry forward some of these recommendations and ideas as we start to engage in those conversations. Would you let me know because I yeah. know the CEO of Moda and um, it should be an entertaining, engaging conversation. Uh, and Kara Stoudemire, mm -hmm. who's, I think it would be interesting to hear um, their initial response to how to be a partner. Yeah, it's really troubling to me right now. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground and we have limited time. So I don't want to put a new topic on. Uh, we can revisit this and we need to revisit this when next we meet. And we'll have some more work accomplished, but we'll, we're going to keep working on this particular set of topics around areas of investment and recognition themes. There's a lot of uh, uh, things we didn't get to touch on tonight, but I think it's okay. Um, I still feel we learned a lot. We heard a lot. And I think there's, there's actionable things for us to come back uh, to this topic with you. So with that, I think um, unless my team disagrees or anyone has some closing words or final words on these things that we've talked about tonight, we could hand it back to Erica um, to, to wind us down. I would just, uh, James, if you would maybe, um, as we wrap this part up, address Ms. Sharon's questions. Um, the final question about timelines. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've been talking about that and how we're going to continue to process this. Uh, so if you just share some yep. of the revelation we've come to in regards to some of these timelines. So, so the, the truth is we have a lot of time when it comes to things that we'll attach to the project later, because they can be, um, in terms of the final specific details, we've got some breathing room. And that's, that's assurances that I have from the engineering and, and final design team. In truth, we're trying to bring all of the topics that we uh, have talked about before in these topics to resolution by the end of this calendar year. And we're trying to do it in chunks. So this is a set of topics, um, wall 15, these bridges, the other walls on the project that we're gonna be working with you over the course of the next three months, getting to a subset of ideas that you all think are promising, send that out for broader engagement so that when we get back, uh, it's hard to believe, but when we get back in the beginning of the school year in September, that we can make some decisions about these things. So this particular set of topics is slated to, um, try to drive to decisions um, at the end of the summer. There, Thank uh, you. Ms. Sharon, there, there was a schedule that's available that was talked about at the outset of the meeting um, that, that has all of the different work packages, everything laid out on it. Um, that could be a resource for you. Um, but if you wanna dive deeper into that, we can, we can do that in a collaboration forum or however, it, it would be as transparent as we possibly can. And then James, one final question um, from Andrew talking about, will some of these um, be presented at the youth engagement um, workshop? Yes, I think we, we'd hope to, Andrew. Uh, you and Sprinna, um, we're trying to pull together a meeting for the facilitators so we can uh, dive deeper into the materials that we would have available. But I would say that anything that we've presented, anything on these Miro boards, all of that is, um, is ready and available to, uh, for that youth uh, engagement forum. Um, that, that is the hope that, that they get a gander at all of this as well uh, and more. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks thank for you, James. The chat. Yeah. Indeed, Marianne, Bill, thank you all so much for your thoughtfulness. Uh, again, I shared with the team, I really, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to work with your team and um, uh, your willingness to dive deep. Tiffany as well, thank you so much um, for being open 
uh, and feeling and experiencing uh, the loss as you uh, have walked through this neighborhood and, and thinking about the history and the legacy um, of a community that was lost and how we might honor that. So uh, I appreciate uh, working with this team uh, in that regard. Uh, Ms. Natalie, if you would share um, the final uh, slides for us. I want to just um, reiterate the message of this broader engagement and a reminder uh, to this group we are looking to you, we need your um, networks, we need your eyes, your hands to extend uh, the link uh, that I sent out to you all to get broader engagement. So to your family members, to uh, the broader uh, um, organizations, we want to make sure that we are elevating the voice uh, of those, the black community that has been touched uh, by um, this project. Uh, we wanna get their insight into some of these other things that we've been working with you all on. And it will be a, a pattern that we'll use moving forward as James mentioned, um, so that we'll engage you all, then we'll have broader community engagement and then we'll bring you back kind of that result as we get into decision-making. So again, uh, for those uh, who joined us late and I'm so appreciative um, of your time. Um, uh, the team is working with the um, city and others in regards to the intergovernmental agreements. And so um, we're hoping um, to have that move forward uh, in the next month or so. Uh, all things seem to be on track for that, that we'll be able to um, uh, bring partners back uh, and then even look for additional partnerships as Ms. Sharon uh, brought forward, looking to those organizations and places close by that would partner in, in this effort. Uh, performance measures. You all worked with Monica, talked with her um, about that. And so we'll be looking to the spring um, for that. Uh, cover design will be advanced, the updated environmental assessment, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, and then the diversity plan that our colleagues at the COAC are working with the project team in regards to. Uh, and we can um, give you all that kind of calendar that James just talked about so that you can see some of these other uh, early work package designs. So we're gonna be looking for your input to be thinking, um, and I know you will, uh, about how we honor the legacy of historic Albina moving forward. We are very excited to partner with Word is Bond and um, that Camp Elso is hosting the opportunity for our youth to um, be a part of this discussion. Um, I know that Sprenavasa will be reaching out to some of you all individually, but I want to put that plug out again for May 14th. Um, Emmanuel Church, right in our Albina corridor, uh, will have an opportunity for black and brown youth to engage, um, to break into small groups, um, we're going to make sure that they're fed and the project team is going to come in and talk with them about this infrastructure project and then get their input as to what they see for their future. And we want to utilize that input to help this group make their decisions. So really as a response to you all's request that this be an intergenerational conversation, um, we're excited uh, to see that come together. Um, this is uh, a lot of work. Uh, I appreciate uh, your commitment, your time. We look forward, uh, we didn't have one this month, uh, but in May, our um, design collaboration forum is an opportunity for you if you have capacity to dive deeper with Bill, Marianne, Tiffany, and James uh, as we dig into some of these um, other ideals on the bridges and on the walls. Uh, so if your uh, calendar allows, please be looking for that invite and dive in there. It's a little less formal than, than our um, monthly meeting, but it's a great opportunity to begin to think through and, and engage around some of these um, ideals. Uh, again, um, we are um, in this process together. This is a collaborative effort uh, thank you to um, I Five Rose Quarter leadership. This is a difficult process, I'm sure. Uh, and um, Megan, your willingness to take those things back, to hear, to listen, to engage, um, and um, be thoughtful and intentional about how you represent um, the community voice. Um, Dr. Holt, would you have any comment as we close out today? Fabulous job, as always, Miss Erica. Thanks, everyone, all of the HAB 
uh, for your continued investment and lift in this process. You stepped in and have been absolutely engaged with thoughtful, insightful, and uh, I think responsible effort to hold this project to its core, to stay accountable and to stay transparent. This is a different way of doing business. It's been different for ODOT and, and uh, uh, some of the, the challenges have shown themselves, but I appreciate the, the integrity by which the, uh, the Historic Outbound Advisory Board has worked to um, not only show up, but continue to roll up your sleeves and invest and do this work. So those of you who also stepped into um, some of the extra work, we appreciate that. And I echo Erica's sentiments around um, Oregon Department of Transportation's willingness to do business differently. My closing thought is simply this, change never happens with ease, never. It always requires more of us than we anticipated. And it's our willingness to, to own the work that makes the difference. And that's what we're seeing. And so to the Historic Albion Advisory Board, thank you so much for owning the work. For those of you who stepped into the space and um, the others who are in the design collaborative and the, the work and the team, and the, the various talents that have been brought to this space, thank you for owning the work. Our community is going to benefit. There's a statement about planting trees when you know you will never live under the shade of the tree. That's what we're doing. We're building for a community we're not necessarily going to be around to see the benefit of but we have a responsibility to the generations that are coming behind us. So I appreciate your willingness to be courageous, to do business differently, and to do something that builds real legacy. Have a great night, everybody. Stay safe, take care of one another and yourselves. We'll see you soon. Good night, all. Thank you so much. Playoffs. Bye-bye. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. The things we sacrifice for the greater good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs>